All right, I am Gypsy for Clean and Sober Stoner, and I'm here with Arvid from Greenleaf, and they have a album coming out this month on the 21st, which I'm very excited about. I have uh, listened to this album probably 20 times. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I've really enjoyed it. Uh, one of the things that I recognized about this album was I listened to it the first time and thought, that was really good. I need to listen again. And by listening the second time, it really felt like an album that I've just heard my whole life, very familiar, very nostalgic, but very, very fresh, nothing uh, uninteresting. So before I ask you a whole bunch of questions, I'd love to hear <laughs> you about about the history of Greenleaf. You guys have been around a while. We have been around a while, yes. I I recognize that this year is my 10th year in Greenleaf. And that's only half of the time that Greenleaf has been around. <laughs> right. So it is it is a project that have been going on for 20 years, but I would say that from the time that I joined the band and Basse, the drummer, joined the band, Sebastian, it's kind of like the, from there, it was not a side project anymore. Then it was a real band, sort of. So the albums before that are a bit more like something fun for Tommy to do when he's not working with Dozer. Mm. Because he 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 cannot stop writing. He's insane in that way. And and, uh, and from Trail, Trails and Passes and Forward, we are a real group, sort of. So for me, this is the fifth album that I'm in with Greenleaf. Yeah, it's been one hell of a ride. It's crazy how fast the time has went by. I mean, I was 23 when I started and I'm 35 now, but I still feel like the kid in the band, <laughs> sort of, which is kind of funny because I am like 10 years younger than Tommy, for example, more than 10 years younger, I think. But um, yeah, it's, I mean, we, we, yeah, we, we kind of almost released an album every other year now or something mm. like that for for this amount of time since 2000, 2014. Um, and we've been touring immensely, especially around between 2015 and 2018, we toured a lot. And then we all got kids at the same time, so then we cooled it down a bit and now we're playing a little bit less but still quite a lot uh so and we are really like we love playing live that's really our thing but uh now nowadays we do it as much as possible with like everything else that you have to struggle with with being kind of a semi-musician as it is because you like you earn money from it but you don't earn enough money from it so you have to have another work and yeah and stuff like that so but uh, yeah, it's been it's been really great. Like it's it's been growing a little bit for every year, sort of, but in a stable way, <laughs> sort of, like not skyrocketing, but still, it it feels nice that we still can write stuff that feels fresh, you know. Like you said, that that's that makes me really happy that people still appreciate the stuff, you know. <laughs> that steady growth, that steady growth is probably pretty nice. Since you all have day jobs and families, you can adjust over time rather than just having to redo everything. Yeah, it's also kind of inspiring to always have a little bit of a struggle with it, you know, that like we were almost full time musicians for a while. And then it's almost sometimes it's a little bit like it can eat you up a little bit. Because you have to, 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 to be able to live from music, at least when you're playing rock music, you have to play so much, you know? Yeah. So after a while, you get like really tired of being at airports, for example. There was a while where I hated airports. Like, <laughs> it was my wor worst place in the world is airports, sort of. But, um, but yeah, I know it. And it's also like when you, like for this 
for this album, for example, I, I, I took a lot of inspiration from other places because of my work that I do when I'm not the musician. So mm -hmm. it's always like you get more context from other places, sort of. So that's one benefit of doing other stuff than playing also. So yeah. And take those influences and infuse it with what you're doing. Yeah, you can kind of write about it like, yeah, I mean, the daily, <laughs> the daily problems, sort of, yeah. <laughs> the, the mundane, most of life is mundane. Exactly. And that's why playing is so nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, touring is like holiday, you know? <laughs> so. Yes, there's something about it. So yeah. you've, you've been on the last uh, few albums. And yes. Tommy, Tommy does most of the writing. Tommy plays guitar and does most of the writing. Is that accurate? Yeah, he writes the riffs. Uh, I write the melodies and uh, and I write the lyrics. Um, and we put it all together, all of us. Mm -hmm. So, so arranging is something that we do together a lot. And we spend a lot of time working on the drums together as well. Because really? that's one thing with Greenleaf that we spend a lot of time working our drummer. <laughs> like, yeah, you like know. A whip. Yeah. yeah. So Sebastian on drums. I I was yeah. right from the first song on the album Avalanche. It just comes yeah. in like the drum leads right away, and yeah. and just rides. You know, you just ride. Yeah, breathe, breathe is the first song, I think, but maybe that's the one you mean. Or Avalanche is the second. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I did mean the, but Avalanche does that too. But yes, breathe out yeah. or breathe, yeah. breathe out. Yeah, that yeah. pulls you in, and that's one thing I recognized is that that opening for breathe, breathe out. It's a, uh, it's very quick. It goes right into syncopation, and then just. Yeah explodes for the rest of the album the drumming is really tight uh the drumming on uh let's see my favorite one which is different horses that yeah. i i love that song for many many reasons but i yeah. go back to it because of the drums and how it it opens really really intense with the drums and it opens with the chorus and ends yeah. with <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was very... It, it, it's kind of like this set your foot down kind of song, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that's why, that's how we wanted it. It's a bit punk in that way, that you just, right from the start, just fuck it, you know? Yes. Here is all we got, here you go. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, but, I but, actually, um, I passed that one on um, once the single came out on that. I was very excited because then I could share it with people. And uh, yeah. the drummer in in my band, I said this this reminds me of what what you do, and it's just that it's all very connected to the vocals, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we yeah we work a, a lot around the drums because we're only four, and it needs to be well, it needs to take a lot of space, sort of, and 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 drive everything on and then and on this album i think that sebastian did a really really good job because we also whipped him a lot in the studio like uh, daniel our producer he's a drummer himself and he used to be the drummer in doser so it's like when the drum is drums are being recorded it's yeah he has to take a lot of shit <laughs> because it's like you can do more you let's do more and and then when he starts getting angry that's when the good stuff comes out you know <laughs> so so it's like yeah he's completely out afterwards you know but it's uh yeah it works so that's well, what that, we do i guess that's a method i need to remember you know get the drummer emotional you'll get that good yeah <laughs> and it's like it's the same for me i'm I'm so I'm really grown up with like soul and blues stuff and like uh, influenced by a lot of singers like that. So mm -hmm. so I tend to listen a lot to the drums and bass when I when I sing. Sort of. I I try to find the rhythmic in a like I try to always hang a lot like not be right on the note like really be slow on the notes. Yes. Uh, uh, and that's like the idea that 
you should have this sort of blues laid backness to the vocals rather than to be on it and 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 uh, yeah me and sebastian and tommy think a lot about this stuff like how you exact accentuate and yeah stuff like the yeah. accent i mean yeah yeah well it, yeah, yeah to to take it to um it's very s storytelling in that way. I did recognize there was a bit of a, a blues, I, I call it like a blues lilt to the way you present yeah. the vocals on this album. And it yeah. matches so nicely to the bass. And it's Hans on bass. Um, yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. So that, do you, do you sort of, you guys work it all out and, you, and the vocals kind of develops lower yeah it's it, like with Hans it's also that he is also a really keen listener mm -hmm. so sometimes when I create the melody he creates a bass line that is similar to that sort of so it's a lot sometimes I work his idea and sometimes he works mine but it's a lot like in Avalanche in that break thing for example we kind of overlap each other's melodies in 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 yeah. the in the soft part and that's like a typical thing that me and Hans does sometimes that we, I, I am also like, I really love bass melodies. I think a nice bass riff on a guitar riff can be like extraordinary, you know? Yes. Like, like the way like Geezer Butler played, for example, you know, it's always this other melody going on. Sort of. Mm -hmm. like. And I... I think that's, that's also really nice to combine with the vocals um, to have that, yeah, almost like jazz sometimes, you know. Yes, where it's supporting yeah. each other. I play exactly. bass, and I'm trying to become a, a good bass player. But it's just, I think, when you're when you're pairing vocals and bass in that play off of each other, it is very yeah. rich. And in in Avalanche, uh, there are two two breakdowns, if I recall correctly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> that first breakdown is just it is it's heavy. It really gets your attention. You've got some great bass leading up to it. Then the song <laughs> continues on and then you guys do it again. And there's this, yeah. little, this little drop in the stomach right before you bring that same breakdown back in. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, that one I just uh, that one I put on repeat and just yeah. have I put it on my big speakers and just go through it a couple of times before I can move on to anything. Yeah, it's a very good, like, blast song, sort yes. of. <laughs> and I've got speakers nearly yeah. as cool as me, so that's kind of nice. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. So... Yeah, we played it. I, I played that one loud a lot in my kitchen as well when I heard the mix, because I saw it sound so massive. Yeah, uh, massive is the word on and that. It's, and I also, like, I also like the thing that it's first time it's just a breakdown and then it's just noise in between and the other time it's vocals in between so i think it's kind of unexpected that a new sort of like the chorus comes back with the breakdown in the end it's like one of those things that i'm really happy with how it turned out sort of well, yeah. and I think that has something to do with that feeling of familiarity, that nostalgia feeling. Like, you know, like I said, I've, I feel like I've grown up with this album, but it doesn't feel, mm. um, it doesn't necessarily feel like a throwback album because it doesn't feel old, no. but it has those familiar, those things that draw you in very, um, there's a, there's a lot of prog rock to it. Uh, a lot of blues, and the blues is never wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I found it to be. Yeah. I went. I went back and listened to a lot of the other albums, and uh, I you know, those I think were more um, more more psych, more psychedelic, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. more spacey, more blues. This one is just. It's kind of its own breed of. Greenleaf idea. Yeah, it's a bit more. It's a bit. It's bit. It's a bit more forward. I think. Like. Yeah. It's like a lot. A lot of. Um, I mean, yeah. I was like, the last album is kind of like a little bit more sad and uh, mm -hmm. like. Yeah, it's a bit more of a depressive album. 
<laughs> I was also not feeling so good when when we did it. And this one is a bit more like it's like post corona somehow. It's like we have this energy right now. And we had that when we were writing it and I think that you can hear that a lot because it's not I mean there are slow songs on it but 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 it's like the slow songs are just in between songs sort of. it it feels like a fucking train the whole record sort of but it but, really does but, 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 but i like it yeah i think the slow songs the two slow songs um the uh the last one the alabastran smile is that right and yeah. then yeah obsidian grin those are the two yeah. slow ones and they i think those titles are interesting that you have obsidian grin and the alabastran smile as the two slow yeah. songs and those titles have this opposing but you know they're kind of opposite of each other but connected exactly and yeah so i played those for a friend of mine who's 20 who mm -hmm. is fairly new to like doom and metal and their take on it was first of all the first thing they said was Oh my God, I love his voice in these songs. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank and you. for for me, those really those two songs, especially especially the uh, Obsidian Grin, that feels very almost almost like New Orleans, like something you would hear. It's very dark, but it's very layered, mm -hmm. and there's a there's definitely a story to that. Mm -hmm. And that that story uh, for for me as a listener, that story is you know watch out for those who are are too shiny, those who are are they're offering. Yeah, that's that's the idea. Problems. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, to be wise and yeah. look out for it because not all that glitters is gold. Kind of feeling, but then you go to the very last song which is the alabastran smile and that one feels reverent to something that one feels a little bit like um maybe submissive or, or worshipful of, of something beautiful i'd love to hear your thoughts on that one yeah but you kind of you you're in the right spot <laughs> on how to like the obsidian green is exactly like that it's it's like uh you shouldn't always trust the shiny things, you know? Yeah. Like, and also how people act in the beginning. Because right. after a while, it might turn out that they they are something completely different, you know? Mm, hard and, lesson. Uh, and then I, 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 I had that idea for a song, and then I wanted to, like, the Obsidian Grin is actually fun how we recorded because it was, or like how we wrote it, because it was just, we had a couple of minutes left in the in the rehearsal room one day. And then Tommy just started on that riff, and I just improvised. Wow! Like a short type of lyrical thing that ended with the obsidian grin, just the words, you know. And then I started to think, like, what does this mean? And then very quickly I created a, a story around it, you know. And then I just wanted it to be kind of basic, like blues, New Orleans, like, the, like Tom Waitsy. Yes. So, okay. And, there you and, go. And, Tom Waits, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I love Tom Waits and Nick Cave yeah. a lot. You know? Oh, yes. So, oh, that's especially great. lyrically, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very, very influenced by them sometimes. How they can describe things and still be so poetic about it, you know? Yes. And that's, and, uh, and that's what I tried to do, especially with Obsidian Green, because I thought it was so nice to just use those words a lot and then kind of just go with it. what a man what a nuisance he will take he will win and yeah. yeah like this dark cloud coming in like the sunshine but then just taking it all away sort of you know like those... I, I had this i had this kind of true detective scene in my mind you know yeah well those two names yeah. that you mentioned that tom waits and nick cave that's that's I got that feeling. There's a there's a, a a darkness that's not sad to the vocals. No, just dark. It just is. You know, it's heavy. Yeah. And uh, what a what an extreme difference between, let's say, uh, uh, different horses and 
Obsidian Grin in how you are using your vocals. Yeah. Yeah, man, I, 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 I do that. I, I, I have like, I have two voices sort of because I, I created the, like when I started singing rock, I, I sang a lot of soul and stuff like that. And I'm grown up with that stuff. But when, That's when I it. started singing a lot of rock, I realized that you had to create another voice to kind of maintain my voice. Because mm -hmm. uh, when you're singing live, if you sing full soul voice the whole time, you don't, your voice is going to get fucked up, you know. Right. So you, so then, so then you, you have to use this also sometimes, and that, that voice, like if you know Dan Auerbach from the Black Keys, for example, yes. he uses this voice a lot. Yeah, like I got mine. He sings like this. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and and and, uh, and that voice I use, I use a lot uh, when it's like. When when the when the rock music around the vocals are really loud, you have to like cut through. You gotta find a register where you can have your melody and nobody will touch it, sort of. <laughs> so then I use I use this I use this voice a lot. <laughs> and then when I have more space I can use this voice, you know, the, yes. the big voice. Uh, so so that's kind of how, how I'm thinking when I'm writing melodies. Like, okay, here it's a lot. Like here, the 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 guitar is going full throttle. So if I'm if it's gonna sound good here, I have to use because I don't like to strain my voice so much. Like mm -hmm. you know, for like this is an example, like James Hetfield sings a lot with the throat sort of. Right. But but I I rather sing with the nose and with the stomach because otherwise I will be sore in the voice after a couple of shows. So really? so it's kind of yeah. But in the Obsidian Green, then I could just use my full voice as much because I have so much space, you know. Yes. Uh, uh, so so it's yeah, it's different all the time. Although I have to say, like after the recording of Obsidian Green, I was really sore because I'm singing the shit out of it. But that was also the point. So. Right. <laughs> and you said it was the last thing you were recording that day. Yeah, exactly. It is, and you can also hear it, and that's why it sounds so good. Because I was like, my throat was burning, you know. Yeah. Like Alabastrian. First, we recorded the second to last was the Alabastrian grin and uh, smile, and then, and then we did Obsidian grin, you know. So. Okay. But 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 they are kind of the inter. They're like small roads between the countries in the in the yeah. album or yeah yeah and they're a little bit they're shorter than the other tracks they're kind of that moment to kind of breathe i tend to yeah. listen to albums as i i like to be outside and while i'm working in my yard i'll go through an album and just put it on repeat and every time one of those would come up i would just kind of stop take a breath think about what i was doing and then yeah. get moving again with the with the next track there is a line. And that's kind of the point also when you're listening to it on vinyl because it's the end of the A side going to oh, the B side. Uh, okay. So that's the, that's why we put them like that. Yeah. I'm going to so. have to pick that vinyl up. Uh, that would be a fun one to spin. Uh, mm. there's, a, there's a line in one of the songs that says some things don't feel wrong, but they don't seem right. Yeah. And that, when I first heard that, I was like, yeah, I got to kind of live by that. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like a very typical feeling, right? Yes. And yeah. and it's like, I, I, I think it works. That line works for like everything at the moment. <laughs> like, yeah, like you live your daily life, but at the same, at the same time, it don't seem right. It's sort yes. of like that, I think. <laughs> and uh, but but it's also, I mean, that 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 line is also that. I mean, I worked a, a lot with addicts and stuff like that, and um, it's always that they have that feeling, you know. So it's a lot about that, and people with with yeah, you know, like head loops, and that's yeah. a lot what the album is about, like this constant feeling of not belonging and stuff like that and uh, how to work with your head i mean i've also done it a lot you know the the, the days and the nights you can't sleep and stuff like mm -hmm. that where it just goes round and round and you're thinking you know that it's the same with breathe and breathe out you know you just 
you won't lose what you got till it's gone, you know. Right. But you think it's already lost. Yeah. Yes. So it's a lot of that that types of emotions that I'm writing about on this album, like yeah, the tricks in your head and the habits you have and the loops you're going through every day and yeah, stuff like that. You know, that's really interesting. A few, a few years ago, you know, maybe six months leading into COVID, I got obsessed with the idea of of loops, the things that just go round and round that we're, we, maybe we slowly become aware of them, you know, and in our own yeah. thought processes, in our relationships, and the choices we make. And I ended up writing about that too. And I'm seeing thematically in a lot of musicians right now, that same idea post COVID, I think that forced us to recognize a lot of those mm -hmm. traits have and those habits. Uh, like Esben Willem said, you know, just trying to move on to the next utopia, thinking it's going to be better, but not making any personal changes, habit changes, thought changes. Yeah, exactly. Forced to pay attention to those things. Yeah, and kind of question everything a little bit. That's like uh, maybe one of the good things with all of that, that you kind of are like, okay, so what is really important? And, and uh, if I'm feeling this way, what should I do about it? And stuff like that, you know? Right. And... Uh, like how to handle emotions and handle habits that that actually are destructive to yourself but you don't you never kind of take a grip on them because the loop is just going you know the habits are just continuing yes so we're on that curve so yeah the exactly. idea of more mental more mental health awareness more you know, personal accountability for our own uh, patterns. I think that's a good thing that came out of the COVID era for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. Like, yeah, it's good to stop for a while, but at the same time, it was a lot of shit too. <laughs> but, uh, yes. but it's, but it's, uh, yeah, I think it's one of the good things about it. I mean, I, 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 I used to live in the city. Now I live on the countryside. I feel better, way better about that and stuff. So. That's good. It's, That's probably good creatively. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's it's it is. It's really like that. I mean, the the less stuff you have you have around you, the more you do. Sort of. It's it's interesting, but it is like that. Boredom That's is great true. sometimes. <laughs> That's very true. When I when I was raising young children, I wanted to make sure that boredom was a part of their upbringing. Because boredom brings yeah, it's really important. Yeah. yeah, creativity and 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 self reliance come out of being bored and having to figure out what to do. Yeah, it has to. It, it forces you forces you creatively, and that's really good, I think. Yes, but you need... just have to step over the line, and then suddenly you don't even think about time anymore. And that's the greatest thing about it when you're in that bubble, you know. That's where the best. But the best art comes from. So I'm curious how yeah. you, how you got connected to Greenleaf since you're you're calling yourself like a junior member. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am. Yeah, it it was actually like I I I'm grown up in the town next to the town that Tommy is from and Dozer is from, and and uh, I was like sort of a fan when I was like around. 15 16 and i had another band with a very stone rock name that was called giant space cruiser <laughs> and we were supporting doser at one point and then uh, tommy saw me on stage and he heard me sing and i think he got interested then um and then uh, a couple of years i think he kept track on me sort of a little bit and then uh, a couple of years later he he, he 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 called me or maybe he sent me a message and asked if I was interested in singing on like one or two of the songs on the new Greenleaf album. And I was really excited. So he sent it them over and I sent it back after two hours. And that became Depth of the Sun. That's one of the tracks on Trails and Passes. Oh, wow. And, 
and then I had already written the whole lyric and done all the melody. <laughs> so then he, he, I think he sent a message back like, maybe you can do the whole album then. <laughs> if, it, if, it's, if you're that quick and it sounds this good, then maybe we can, can you come up and we can, you know, because I was living in Stockholm then and he's, he was living in a, a town called Borlänge north of, north of Stockholm and, and that's how it started. And then I came up to the rehearsal room and then we started writing together. And then after like two or three weeks, we had an old album sort of. Wow. So it was like really, really inspiring at that time. And then, yeah, we released that on Small Stone Records. And, and before we released it, we went on a tour and then that worked great as well. So then we sort of decided that, okay, we're going to play now. And then we started playing a lot. <laughs> so, so it was kind of, uh, a, yeah, it was kind of instant then. That's great. Yeah, it was kind of like it, it went really quickly. I was, it was funny because I was playing in sort of an indie group in Stockholm at that point and also studying classical vocals at oh. the academy in, in Stockholm. So, so like it was. Yeah, it was like a change, but but it was really good. It, when we started playing live, it was so much fun. So I was just like, ah, this this is what what I want to do. Like, it's so mm, as the music we play is it's so fulfilling to play it live. Sort of, it's like I find it a really good music to play live because it moves a lot of people. Like, like you can see how people, you know, the jeans vests start going. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it, but like we really want everybody over, you know. And yes. it's it's very rare with, where you when you're in a band like that where where everybody has sort of the same clear goal that we're supposed to make people move and feel like we're gonna make them really happy, sort of. Um, yeah. Well, I I so love that. That's, that's how a, it. That's a big deal to me. Music yeah. that me that makes me move. Uh, to make music that is like that is also important to me. I know with this album, several times I'd be listening to something and I would just stop and I'd be getting into what I was hearing and my my dogs are always following me around. If, and if I stop, then they're stopped, you know? So they they <laughs> kind of dance and, okay, what's happening next? And they'd settle down by my feet. And then I'd move on to the next thing. They get so irritated. There's a lot of things to move to in this album. A lot to dance to. Yeah. I think it's it really does move really well. I think this yeah. is yeah, well, it's good. It's a groove. It's really important. Yeah, it's I nice think this is kind of a, a very <laughs> it's a very accessible album. I think I think this is one that I've been able to play for people you know, within our age range, people who are much younger and people who are much older. I think it's got a quality that, as Scott likes to talk about, uh, boomers can get into. And then these, uh, whatever the, the current generation <laughs> things is, is called, can really enjoy it. When I played, uh, and I keep referencing it, when I played Different Horses for a friend of mine who's early 20s, He's listening and he just kept going, Oh, oh my goodness. Oh wow. What what are they even doing there? He was very, very drawn yeah. into it. And that that's one of my favorite oh, things. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> play when I find something like this that I that I really like, I like to play it for people of different generations and then play it for other yeah. musicians, you know. This is a very yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. universal album. I think this album is, it's very defining. It's, you know, all of these things coming together for you guys, musicianship wise, writing wise, and where you're at in your lives. And it's a, it's a really heavy hitter. And I kind of think that you guys are going to end up doing probably a lot of shows off of this one. I hope so. <laughs> I'm sorry, my, I'm a bit distracted. My daughter and my girlfriend are going up the stairs. She's supposed oh. to sleep, but she's not. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little hard to sleep. Uh, uh, thank you so much. That's really nice. 
I hope so too, of course. <laughs> uh, we, we are really proud about it and we're really happy how it sounds. So I, I think also Daniel did an amazing job with the sound on this album. So oh, it's good. I, I, I really hope that it's a step upwards again. But, but uh, it's like I'm very Swedish in that way. I won't expect too much because we don't here. But we will see. <laughs> like sweet Swedish people are very critical to it to our own stuff, sort of. We have this expression called uh, uh, lagom, which is like, in, in Sweden, it's not good to be too good, and it's not too good to be bad. So you're supposed to be in between. <laughs> like, and that's the expression lagom. So like everything should be in between, that's good. <laughs> but but so, so you should always be humble, you should not be, but, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm extremely happy with how the album turned out it's nice i'm going to remember that lagom lagom yeah lagom. The, la the land of lagom yeah the land of lagom i really yeah. like that as i was raising kids you see extremes in people's personalities they're either you know sometimes you have people who are just they're really high up all the time or they're really low and i would always try to teach and i still try to teach this to kids let's try to live in the middle like we talked about before the mundane that's where most yeah. life happens and being comfortable in the middle is you you get longevity out of that you know we're yeah, not exactly washing and burning yeah, there is a like there is this comic from Sweden that has an example of this where it's like it's about a little boy and his dad and it's called Alfons Åberg and uh, the, the the dad and the, they also have a grandma and and the and the boy and the dad after Christmas Eve the day after they're so sad because oh now everything is boring again and it's sad again yeah. and then the grandma starts laughing at them. And she says, like, yeah, but but if it would be Christmas Eve every day, you wouldn't you wouldn't like it anymore, you know, and and, and but in a much more funny way than I told yeah. the story now. But but that's kind of like, yeah, that's that's a, that's very Swedish that it's like it's good when it's OK. Yeah. <laughs> I think maybe it has to do with the weather also, because we have different weather every day. Uh, you just and have to shit. accept it every day. Yeah, like a summer day, you can have rain, snow, uh, like everything, wow. and especially where I live. And it's like, uh, so we always talk about the weather. In Sweden, you talk about the weather all the time. And and maybe that's why we're like, yeah, it's nice when it's not so warm and it's not so cold. <laughs> it's kind yeah. of, everything should be like in between. <laughs> yes, like uh, it's just right, like Goldilocks. It's just yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, speaking of being a Swedish band, I listen to a yeah. lot of Swedish bands, and I think your this album in particular, it it feels very universal. It doesn't necessarily feel like a Swedish album. That's not either a, a compliment or a put down. It's just kind of a fact that I yeah. could I could have easily believed on most of the tracks that this was coming out of Nashville. Or yeah, Auburn. yeah. <laughs> so, that's, that's really nice to hear. <laughs> that's good. really I cool for me. That would be a good thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, we are influenced by a lot of stuff from the US. And uh, but also from Great Britain, you know, it's like, but 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 I think we have a the thing is that we have a very Afro-American tradition in music, like mm -hmm. all of us are listening to a lot of that stuff and uh, and grown up with that stuff. But we also have this Swedish tradition of the sad melody sort of that comes through the folk music. Uh, but on this album, I think, as you say, it's kind of, yeah, it's it's very straightforward in that way. It's a very straightforward rock album in that way sort of yeah it is like we had more we had more of those a little bit more focused melodies on the last one for example like we had a song there called needle in my eye for example where the guitar thing is kind of a, almost like a violin thing that would be in a swedish traditional song mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. but um but yeah it's it's 
yeah, it's cool that you, you can think that it would be from Nashville, for example. That's that's honoring also for me as a vocalist. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, and then it makes it even cooler when I play it for someone and say, yeah, they're from Sweden. And they're like, what? You know? <laughs> I thought it's another yeah. element of cool in this album. So what uh, I'm I'm curious about, well, you're you're obviously you're the, the vocalist and the the guitar work is is very clean. It really is a very, you know, almost classic rock, but a little heavier. Do you do you know like is is he doing a lot with pedals? Is it very simple? It sounds clean and simple. He he is kind of simple in the way his setup is, but but he uses a lot of boosts. Oh, okay. Like, he has like a. I don't think he necessarily uses so many fuzz pedals. It's more like overdrives. But okay. he uses a lot of overdrives. It's kind of funny to see his guitar because he has a delay and a reverb. And the rest and the wah and the rest is just overdrive pedals like boosters. So okay. so he sort of goes. It's funny when he talks about it sometimes because it's like, yeah, I use these two distortions all the time, and then I have three more layers of 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 overdrive distortion. So that's kind of the way. But then on this on this particular album, we also used some octave pedals. Okay, I caught because that. Yeah, because especially in Breathe, Breathe Out, for example, there's an octave pedal used almost all the time. Yes. Especially in the break where I sing with the guitar at the mm -hmm. end. Mm -hmm. There's a, so, but that was, that was like, we found this great octave pedal in the studio. And then our producer, Daniel, he couldn't, he, he, he wouldn't stop using it because he loved the sound so much because it was so fat. So there is a couple yeah. of underlayers with that. On the head, on almost all the heavy parts in some songs, because it it just sounds so gigantic. So now Tommy has been forced to also get an octave pedal, there which he, he which he didn't really like, I think. But but now he has to have one as well. So yeah. Well, yeah, it gives it a nice thick sound. It's it's really good. And then yeah. do you, do you know that with the bass? The bass to me. It's very low. Is it? Is it just a standard tuning? Are you guys doing a different? No, no, we're doing it in C. Okay, okay, yeah. okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. the, the bass is nice and low and very, uh, very clear, very clear. It doesn't get yeah. mixed. I'm not really sure about the setup on the on the last album. What they actually used in the end, I know he uses. He doesn't use any. He just uses the distortion from the from the uh, from the uh, from the amplifier usually. Yeah. But it's one of those old ones, uh, not the Ampeg, the acoustic. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. So so he uses this is kind of nice because they're not so expensive these tops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean they're usually around like five hundred euros or something like that. Um, but they they sound great, especially with this tuning and his eighty k eighty k bass. Yeah, so I I know sometimes he uses an overdrive when when we're doing festival shows because he can't bring the top or something. But right. but um, yeah. but usually he just uses the distortion from the acoustic. So, but I don't know how we did it in the studio. It could be that there's a bass man in there and maybe. It, sometimes we use an old Fender top as well. Mm -hmm. So, so what is and then there's probably a line signal as well, just to make some more clearance. Yeah. And I would guess that Daniel put some distortion on that as well. We also record in a really nice studio in Stockholm, the old The Hive studio, and and uh, they they have an SSL desk there. And if you put it to the brink of uh, of gain, it has its own distortion that is analog in the actual console, and that also sounds really good. So sometimes we just push it to the limit. Uh, so yeah, exactly what's in the bass sound on the album, I'm not sure, but 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 it's a combination of the things I've said, I think. Well, it comes to really well because I I always listen to tracks I, I listen between 
Raycon earphones, and then my car stereo, yeah. just a Jeep car stereo, and then um, my JVC speakers. They're they're big speakers. So I like to hear the difference, you know, when you're yeah. listening to, and it and the bass comes through really well on everything. Really, really enjoyed that. You said yeah. the name of the studio. What's the name of the studio you mentioned? Uh, nowadays, it's called Studio Grundal, um, and it's in the it's in uh, Grundal is the place where the studio is. It's the actual part of town, and uh, it's like in the south of Stockholm. Okay. Uh, it used to be owned by Pelle Gunnefelt, who recorded the Hives, and uh, he also worked with Refused, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, and also Viagra Boys, if you know. Yeah. Uh, by Agro Boys, yeah. It's a friend of mine playing the drums there. Uh, and it's a really nice studio. It's owned nowadays by uh, David Castillo, I think his oh. name is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Catatonia has recorded there as well, and a bunch of metal bands nowadays. Maybe Sepultura has been there as well. Very cool. Yeah, so it's like a really good, it's a really good studio. Yeah. yeah. We, we we recorded all of our albums since I've been in the band there. So nice. We are really comfortable there, and Daniel is really comfortable there. He knows the board in and out and all the microphones. And yeah. That so, makes a big difference. Yeah, it saves us a lot of time and money to, to spend more time on the actual recording rather than to find out how the fuck stuff works. Yeah. Which is usually how it is when you come to a new studio because it's yes. like oh what what's this patch and where does this go and, yeah uh, short out yeah. all the ghosts in the machine exactly yeah. so do you guys are you guys this this is the big project but are you guys working on other projects like do you do any other side projects? I, yeah 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 i have i have two at the moment i have pools which is my kind of like uh, that's more like acoustic uh, music, almost like pop, a lot of folk. Ooh. We released an album, uh, what is it now, two years ago, and then we released an EP, and we have another album that's done, but I don't know when it's going to be released because it's kind of a a project I have on the side that we're doing when we have time. Yeah. It's something that we started during Corona with really great musicians, but when Corona stopped, everybody started being busy again. Yes. So it's a bit like that. And then I'm also in this project, Young Acid, that's uh, just released an album that is more like punk. Yeah. Uh, so that came out on uh, Majestic Mountain Records on the okay. 25th. Okay. It's, the the record is called Murder at Maple Mountain. It's about, it's kids' stories that we made rock songs out of from this famous author from Sweden. Yeah. Oh, check that out. That sounds... it, 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 it's the it's the bass player from Doomcraft, Martin, and the singer, and and then the guy from Nova Rupta and uh, uh, Grand Cadaver as well. Yeah, there's a a mix. People say super group sometimes, but I don't like that word. A bunch of musicians from different bands. Yeah. Yeah, dream group. Yeah. We say that here. <laughs> yeah. The dream team or the dream group. Yeah, but it's like something we did on the side because it's fun. And we're probably going to play something live, but not much. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. So. Well, speaking of live, you said you guys are playing. Greenleaf is playing a lot. Uh, where do you guys are? You guys just ready for this tour, or are you just waiting to see how how things go? No, we. we I think we're ready. We were doing the summer festivals now, and then. And then it's with Slomosa in October, and it's going to be great. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be really nice to do the the new songs live as well. Like, we're probably doing at least three or four from the new album. So oh, that's... it's going to be really nice to try them out, you know, and also see the response on the tracks because you never know. You know, we, we, we were in Spain and did a couple of shows, and then we played Breathe, and that because that it had come out and, and and it was a really good response so mm -hmm. it's going to be really fun to see different horses and avalanche how people reacting to them so yeah yeah i think it's going to really get people but i also think mm -hmm. when you get to slow down and sing like 
obsidian grin you're gonna you're gonna get people's attention yeah i hope so it's it's also like a really interesting thing to do live because obsidian grin is not the type of song we have done before live so it would be really interesting to see how people react to that but i i think the response would be great hopefully so yeah i'd want to yeah. see it for sure that yeah uh, so you guys are touring in Sweden. Are you touring um, pretty locally? Or are you going Central Europe? We're doing now in the fall, so a lot of shows in in especially Germany, of course, because mm -hmm. it's the biggest and countries around that. And then we are continuing with Europe next year. I cannot say when because it's not announced yet. And then we might go somewhere else as well, but I, I cannot say anything yet yes. because it's not so. No, okay. So, but we would do as much as we can. We Our plan is to tour this album a lot, so we will do at our utmost to do that. So. Well, hopefully you guys come my way. California is a great spot. Yeah, yeah, it would be awesome. I hope so. <laughs> It really would. We really want to go to the U.S. It's just a bit tricky with the visas and expenses. That's the yes. thing. Yes. Yeah, I would imagine there's a lot of logistics. Yeah, it is. Yeah. But it, it's a long time coming for Greenleaf to go to the U.S., so it should be happening soon. I really hope so, at least. So. Well, but with, uh, with, Ma with Magnetic Eye Records now, it's it, it might be a bit easier because... It's an American label also, so maybe we will get some more support towards stateside. I hope so, at least. So I hope this helps with that. Uh, yeah. One question here. If you could, yeah. two-part question. I'll just do the one. Uh, okay. The dream band that you would like to open for, who would that be? Oh, yeah. I've had this question before. It's always so tricky. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, like, if you would ask my... You, my 15 year old self that then it would probably be like queens of the stone itch or something right. like that mm -hmm. that makes sense uh, i think it would be a good fit but but nowadays what what would be like I, I, it's too hard. I'll go with that. I'll say Queen's or Stone Age. <laughs> there you mm. go. <laughs> yeah. And then one last, one last little question. Out yeah. of bands that you have seen, do you have a favorite, most memorable concert? Because you know, you, when you see a great show, you always feel like it's the best show you ever right. seen. Yeah. But then after a couple of weeks, you're a bit like, hmm, was it? Well, uh, then you see something else. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, my uh, my my drummer in my band. Every show we go to, it ends up being that was the greatest show I've ever seen. You know, just because you're in that that moment of that experience. Yeah, I mean, I saw I saw I saw one. I'm not sure it's the best concert I've ever seen, but but one show that I I, I always find memorable and I always think about is that I, I saw Melvin's at Strand in Stockholm uh, a couple of years ago with the Big Business. <gasps> And really? that was yeah, and that was oh man, that was an incredible show with oh. those two drummers at the same time. It was yeah. like uh, yeah, that was really really good. So that's kind it's of one, that's, but... it's one of my best rock shows, I think. So. Yeah, oh, that would yeah. leave you humbled, I think. Yeah, it, yeah, it it really was like that, yeah. And then I also like uh, I I really like a guy called uh, Daniel Norgren. And he plays more like folk. Mm -hmm. yeah, he's a really, really good uh, singer-songwriter from Sweden. And he does amazing live shows. And it's also one of the best I've ever seen. Like, I saw him at the theater in Stockholm, and that was also incredibly good. So those two, maybe. So. Something about seeing live folk music, it's just, it slows time down. Yeah, it's so much space in the music, and that's mm -hmm. what I like so much. You can do so much with that. That's yeah. why I have Pools, the other band, actually, because sometimes you just need more space for weirdness. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, but, yeah. Very true. Yeah. I saw Nico Case in Santa Cruz earlier this year, and you know she's in that folk realm. And again, just so much space vocally. She just she filled that auditorium with her voice, and it was. Yeah so soothing yeah it's incredibly good when it's good yeah. mm -hmm. 
It really is. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Before we sign off, is there anything that I didn't ask you that you want to share with with the music world? No, I don't think so. I mean, just enjoy the album. I'm really happy you like it, and I hope everybody else would like it. But we're really proud of it, so it's all yeah. good. 